Hello, hello, ladies and gentlemen. This is your girl Mitzi, and this is Mitzi. Let's think about it. Today, we are thinking about a child's incarceration. You know, as a mother, as a new mother, this is something that is gut wrenching, you know, to really think about that other mothers out there have to go through that. Because if they didn't, well, the prison system wouldn't have so many people in it, right? So, <laughs> This is truly a taboo to think about, and this is why I'm so glad to have Lori on my show to help us think about this in a different perspective and in somebody else's viewpoint, because once we put ourselves in somebody else's perspective, we truly think about the topic or the situation most definitely differently. So thank you so much, Lori, for coming on my show. Um, So let's just get right into the topic. I know that you wrote a book, My Heart Behind Bars, and I'm just interested to know why... Why did you write your book? Why did you share your story? Oh, well, I shared my story because it was gut wrenching. It was super lonely and it was um, it was probably one of the hardest things I ever went through. And I had nobody to talk to about it. I had nobody to share. I had nobody that understood. And I found it odd because there's like you say, the prison system's full and yet I didn't know a soul. I had I knew, knew nobody that had a child that had gone to prison. And then when when it comes about, people are so focused on the crime and the people that they don't really think about you as the parent. So you get kind of get lost in it. And then there's nowhere to talk to because everybody is so focused on the other part of it that your grieving and your heartache gets a hundred percent dismissed. Right. It's like you're shamed for feeling bad or you're shamed because you're sad or you're shamed because you miss them because they've done something horrible. So therefore they need to be punished, which it's true. There is a consequence to everybody's behaviors. However, I I didn't do anything. I just I just loved them. I just had babies that I loved and they grew up and had their own journey. So basically, I wrote the book so that nobody would ever have to feel as alone as I did, right? Like if they ever have a child that gets incarcerated, God forbid, that they don't have to walk around feeling isolated or like Medusa, that everybody's afraid to talk or look at you because, you know, they might turn to stone or something bad might happen to them. Or it it was just, I just don't want anybody else to ever feel like that. No, I think that's beautiful to have that (laughs) outlet. Yeah, I think it is very beautiful to have that outlet and to have that community or to start a community so that other parents out there to that feel this isolation and this taboo, like you were talking about, feeling like Medusa, like, God forbid anybody even looks in your direction because now you're labeled as someone that has someone that went to, has a child that went to prison or went to jail. And it's it's a terrible stigma to put on someone when it's like you said, they make their own choices. You were there to love them and you're not responsible for how they choose to do their life. So you shouldn't be shamed or have that guilt on you when it's not even on you, you know? And I think that's nice to have that. Yeah. Um, I think um one of the first things I I I agree obviously <laughs> yeah right uh one of the things that I would like to know is that when you first found out that your son went to jail what was the hardest thing for you like what was the first thing that came to mind when you were like oh. <laughs> so well it kind of goes in stages because you're in a state of disbelief at first so when so i had to go at the same time um and when the first one got arrested um you they don't they don't let you know they actually even have your child they don't really tell you much right i just kind of knew because my girlfriend told me she went to go pick up my son and he wasn't there he was in the back of a police car so i knew the police had him um but i didn't know why and i didn't know I didn't know anything. And then they don't tell you anything. So because we have privacy laws, I don't know how it works in the States, but in Canada, they have privacy laws and they don't have to tell you if the child's an adult. And um, so you're kind of just hung there for a bit. So you kind of are stuck in a bit of disbelief because you're like, well, 
Maybe it's a misunderstanding. You don't know why they're there. So it could be he was drinking and he was acting like a jerk. You don't, you don't really know. So you don't really, you don't really feel much of anything except an irritation that your child misbehaved and is in the back of a police car. Cause you're like, what the heck you moron, right? Like, you know, what did you do? Um, but then, you know, a day later you find out more. And then not only do they have one of my children in custody, but they're also looking for my second child. So then I'm like, huh, this is a little bit more real. And then I still didn't know what had happened and they still don't tell you. And then by the third day or the second day, they, um, they let you know that it's a little bit more serious, right? Because they need information from you. And I think that's when it really starts to, to set in that, that, you know, that your children are in some serious trouble and you don't still know everything, but at that moment, you know, it's not good and your heart sinks. So at that point in time, I would say you're probably in your home and it feels like the walls have just come crashing down, right? Do you know what I mean? Like everything kind of gets smaller and you get more confined. It's like everything around you is crumbling and you're just kind of bad and you know that you cannot do a dang thing. So that's what that feels like. It's super yeah. unpleasant. Oh, I couldn't imagine that feeling, but I liked your description because it's very vivid and you're able to really put yourself in that perspective. Like, yes, I, I've had that moment. So maybe not in that same scenario, mm -hmm. but that moment where it just feels like you're, you're just, you know, that Simpson meme where he's just going into the bush. <laughs> that's, that's basically just, oh, everything's just consuming you. So it's crazy to see that you were able to find some goodness out of it to write a book and I guess my next question is what do you keep how do you keep yourself in a good mood and like what is your medicine to keep yourself going well now now is a whole lot easier than when um <laughs> when it first happened when it first happened I didn't I'm not even gonna lie when it very first happened when I first got the calls when for everything first started I I was not in a good spirit I was a nothing I was completely numb I basically forced myself to get out of bed because I had other children, I had a job, and you don't really know what's happening. So you just keep going. Basically, you get up, you put one foot in front of the other. I can't even tell you how, because there's days where I woke up and I thought, it hurts to breathe, but you do it anyways. But as time went on, I found some outlets, like um, I, I started to do artwork. And I found that um, I had never painted before in my life, but I, I paint and I painted a ton when the boys were in prison. It was a, I think it was an expression for words that you couldn't, couldn't speak. I couldn't, I couldn't articulate the pain or the sorrow or the sadness or the loneliness. So I painted. And I think when you are able to express it, it helped to have a little bit of a release. And then it gave you something to kind of do to look forward to. It's not like I woke up and was like, yeah, I'm going to paint today, but it was a, you know, maybe I'll paint today and it will make me feel a little bit better. And I um, would go for walks. I drew I, anything that was an energy exertion. I found helped me to get through a day. You know, it's people crazy. were not good. Like I isolation was what I did for quite a while because people just um, ignited some of the pain or the anger or the frustration. So I did find that I spent a fair bit of time alone doing art art was my outlet yes so art yeah. art and writing uh, awesome yeah. well that's a good that's a good way to do it because I've spoken with other people about turning their pain into creativity and it sounds like that's what you're able to do and I think that's the beauty of having art as an outlet because you, you can't have nothing wrong you know there's no oh. such thing as anything wrong that you do and that you put out you know it's your your authenticity on artwork you know and I think that's what that is what's beautiful yeah. and I guess my next question is when your sons got released how was that transition transition with you and your my frame of mind and your sons was that difficult to have that adjustment or was that just like any other day oh gosh no it's not like any other day at all um so they got released at different times um 
my first boy, Christopher, that got released did less time and he had been in trouble before. So he, he adapted quite well. He, he wasn't away from society as long as my boy Drake. And so he, he integrated back quite easily. I mean, we spent a lot of time. He didn't, he didn't, um, he didn't, he wasn't as antisocial, right? Like he wasn't as reserved. So him, it was easy. It was a little bit more of a flow. He got into it a little bit easier. He connected with his friends more. Um, and he was pretty well happy, right? Like he didn't, when I went to go get Drake, um, there was much more of an anticipation. He had been incarcerated for a longer period of time and it was his first time ever being in trouble. And, mm -hmm. um, you know, like, I mean, I was super ecstatic to see him, but I could see when I picked him up that there was some hesitation in him and his eyes didn't look the same. He was a little bit more reserved. He is a little bit more, um, I don't want to say dark, but hollow. I don't know how okay. to explain it. You know, um, that's, a, that's a good description. I, I gather you have a baby now, it sounds like, right? You have a baby. Yeah. And, mm -hmm. you know, when you see your baby, you see that brightness in them and they're like vibrant and alive. Um, yeah. when I picked Drake up, he, he wasn't like that. I mean, I could still see that he loved me and I could still see that he was happy to be free, but there was a reservation about him that kind of dimmed his light a little bit. And yeah. so, um, it, it was a, it was a big adjustment for him. Like even <laughs> leaving the prison, he hadn't been in a car for so long. He got car sick. Um, mm -hmm. then we had to take a ferry where there was like 1400 people. He had not been around anybody. Right. So that him around people was, I mean, he held on to the back of my shirt and followed me around the ferry till we could get it. Wouldn't go to a table by himself. He had to sit like I had to go sit with him. Like it was so overwhelming to be back in society and to have yeah. all these people. And it was such a stimulation that he was just not used to anymore. Mm -hmm. So there was that. And then there was the edginess, right? Like, cause he hadn't been around these people and yeah, so it was it was challenging, and and Drake took quite quite a bit of time to adapt, kind of isolated a bit, and tried to get back into the fact that he had some freedom, and and then had to wrap his head around the behaviors and the consequences of their behaviors. I mean, they know it when they go to prison, but they don't really feel it till they're out of prison. Does that make any sense? Like yeah, you know, everybody knows sense. they've done something wrong. That's why they're incarcerated. But when they're out that's when they really deal with the consequences of the choices that they made, right? That's when you find people accepting you and, and allowing you back in a circle. So that's really when the punishment actually happens. Yes, I like that statement that you said at the end. That's when the punishment actually happens because that is when everything settles in and that transition from prison life and that cell life is totally different compared to out and scavenging out in the mm -hmm. world and people don't realize that half of the time to get that frame of mind out of your out of your your system takes a very long time and mm -hmm. that's a lot of the time people end up just going back into the prison system just because they feel more comfortable doing what they know versus doing what they don't know and don't know what to expect because that must have been terrifying for him you know he was restricted you know he has a lot of restrictions you know a lot of not a lot of contact with people and to just be around so many people at once I feel that they should have like a transition period for inmates when they are about to get out to help them actually transition in the in in life you know because just meeting your PO is not enough you know because your PO doesn't really do much for you you know in my opinion they don't they just oh, right. okay you haven't done drugs you haven't done alcohol you're not in trouble you have a job you have a place to live okay you're good you know that's all they do they do their little checklist and that's it so I'm just like okay yeah. well this is pointless you're no help yeah. to me oh, so it's nice to see yeah. that you're very honest and that that it's it's something that you are open to share with other people I mean are there any words that you can share with any parents that may be going through this transition now <laughs> and that may give them some type of hope or some type of like knowledge <laughs> well 
I, I, I think that every situation is different and it depends really what your child is going to prison for. Um, there, there are a lot of people that do reach out and I think that one of the things that is good about reaching out to somebody who's already gone through it is that you get to see a different side, right? So I don't think any, I don't think there's anything you can say that will absolutely prepare a parent for when their child is incarcerated. And I don't care if your child is 40, 50, it, it doesn't really matter because you love your children and you have a belief about your children. And, and when your child is taken away from you, no matter what age, and that's what it's like, they're taken from you, from your day-to-day -day life, it, it's heartbreaking. So nobody, you just, it would like, it would be trying to explain to somebody what it's like to have a child die. I mean, it's a bit more extreme because their child never comes back. Ours gets to come back if we're lucky. However, you can never explain to another person how that feeling is going to be because you just don't know it until it happens, right? Like you don't understand it until it's there. All I could say to somebody is that you have to be honest with yourself, be honest about who your children are, accept the circumstances, and then do your best to take care of yourself so that you can take care of your inmate. And that the hardest hurdle I hear from a lot of people is to not be ashamed of speaking about it. Like I know a lot of people that are like, oh, my son's arrested. I don't tell people at work. I don't share with anybody. It's too much. I think that's the worst thing you can do. The worst thing you can do is add more shame that's already has shame on you. I think the best thing you can do is be honest. I mean, you you are not responsible for your child's behavior, but you are responsible for loving them and you are responsible for integrating them back into society. So if you're already at a place where you have shame attached to what's going on, how are you going to convince people or allow people to give them another chance or to look at them in a different light if you're too embarrassed to even say what's going on? And I know it's a natural thing in the beginning, but I really think the best thing people can do is get the help they need and to speak honestly and freely about it because that's where the healing is. That's where, the, that's where you can help people in society understand a different point of view um, I think that's the best thing you can do that. That's what I would suggest and reach out. Like I, I have no qualms. I leave my phone number on my website. I think it's on the book. I, I will talk to anybody because I just, I just don't think people should struggle in that by themselves. So I like that very much. I, and I think that's absolutely right. Every situation is going to be different, you know, because every, every situation is different you know you can't really do a generalization mm -hmm. for for just a topic when in reality every everyone is going to react and and perceive it differently so it is very subjective so at least thank you for that because you know people do need to take that into consideration as well and mm -hmm. you know if anybody out there that wants to reach out to Lori I do have her website on mine and you can find her lovely photo just just click on it and you can have direct access and see all the goodness that Lori has to offer to us because you know what this is a good outlet for individuals who are going through this and like she says just be honest you know be honest that you need this community because there's none out there there's none out there there's That's more right. shame and guilt and taboo and we don't need to live like that not, especially not for someone who has the freedom of their own free will to make their own choices you know everybody has their own choice mm -hmm. so you can make this choice to reach out and seek out community already so that's it that's the show thank you all for thinking with us and listening and don't ever forget to be safe out there bye